Hello everyone, I'm Brazen Eagle, and thank you for joining me here. So today, we have a very different type of video, where I go over a book and understand how academia is pushing for socialism and ultimately communism. The book today is called Savage Inequalities by Jonathan Kazol. This book takes place between 1988 to 1990 and explores how the poorest schools in the U.S go about their daily business and the clientele that the schools serve. It should be noted here that Jonathan Cazole drives home the idea repeatedly throughout the book that it is only the fault of white Americans, especially wealthier white Americans, for the suffering of the poor, especially black children, no matter what argument you might bring up to counter it. I do want to say before we begin, though, that I don't want the poor children to suffer, but I must take in all perspectives. So, throughout the book, Cazole travels from East St. Louis to Chicago to New York to New Jersey and even San Antonio to explore the terrible conditions that some of America's children must go through and really the lack of supplies that teachers have to educate their students. In some of these schools, there aren't enough books, the buildings themselves flood or aren't heated or cooled during the different weather seasons, and sometimes there aren't enough teachers to actually teach students. Obviously, these aren't good conditions for anyone's children, but Kazol goes even further. The author asks the reader the question on page 50, why not spend on children here at least what we would be investing in their education if they lived within a wealthy district like Winnetka, Illinois, or Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Is fairness less important to Americans today than in some earlier times? Is it viewed as slightly tiresome and incompatible with hard-nosed values? And most importantly, what do Americans believe about equality? Ooh, and that, my friends, is all you need to know about Kazol. He is a sociologist, but more importantly, he's more of a socialist and even potentially a communist. He demands or encourages the reader, who is most likely a teacher, to agree that equality is a noble goal for any civilized or wealthy nation. How can we be a great nation if we do not equalize all funding for students? What does this say about the supposed American democracy, as mentioned by Kazol several times in the book? Isn't a democracy for equality? Why do we not take from the wealthy people a supposed fair share and just give it away to schools and students that will end up floundering it? It appears that no one ever told this sociologist that life isn't fair, or at the very least, explained why life is unfair. I mean, it's unfortunate, but realistic, that equality can never truly be achieved. I don't want the children to suffer, of course, but, you know, it is up to the parents to ensure that their children succeed. Regardless, this book is merely a tool to show how academia is guiding future teachers into believing that socialism is the only way forward. However, on the topic of fairness, I do want to mention how the author attempts to manipulate the word fairness to further his agenda, as mentioned by Kazol several times throughout this book. Most of the funding for public education comes from property taxes. The author supports the idea that the wealthier counties or areas of each state should pay more to improve the conditions of terrible schools because it would be supposedly more fair to those students. But how is that fair for the taxpayer? Is it fair to take even more money away from those who have earned it to pay for the education of other people's children in districts that are very far away? Is it fair to take money away from wealthier schools and just give it to poorer schools, as mentioned on page 252? Is it fair to lower the standards of one school to attempt, to only attempt, to improve the success and conditions of another? As I will talk about later, how can we attempt 
to create a supposed fair education system even though currently it is unfairly paid for by wealthier people. Now, after reading the book, the two most important things that Kazol repeatedly brings up throughout the book are the ideas that if poor people had enough money for schools, then they would be just as successful as the supposed wealthiest and most educated individuals in America. And secondly, it is systematically white people. Yes, white people keeping black people down, and of course some Hispanics, in order to suppress them. Yes, this is what we are dealing with here. So, for example, on page 57, when Kazol is in Chicago talking to a principal regarding what resources the principal would need to have a better school and education for its children, the principal surprised the author Kazol by saying that, and I quote, money would be helpful, but it's not the major factor. The parents are the problem, end quote. Because Kazol wants to push an ideology, he is somewhat taken back by this honest answer that we are going to explore. So, when you take your children to school, you would assume that they will become more and more educated and perhaps relatively sophisticated or more cultured. From the teacher's perspective, a student can only become more educated or sophisticated if the student has the proper foundation for learning, right? If the parents, or they're the lack of, choose to not create an environment that would help their children learn, then a teacher really can't do very much. A teacher can provide all sorts of avenues for learning, but if the child is not taught from the parents to value education at least partially, maybe not fully, but at least partially, then there's nothing an education can provide. Now look at it like this. A child may spend potentially eight hours a day at school. That means the child or student spends 16 hours of the day outside of school. A school and teachers can only do so much for the students. If anything, a child may see a few different teachers every day for maybe an hour. The greater influence on the child is of course the home environment, which will dictate how that child will grow up and perform. Are there exceptions to this? Oh, absolutely. There are a few cases where despite the home environment being a train wreck, the child grows up to become successful. My example that I bring up that is an, ex an exception to the rule is a case of my father, but those exceptions do not prove the rule wrong. The vast majority of the time, it is the home environment and really the father's leadership that has the greatest influence on the child. And that's why the poor schools and students in America are usually black. The father, of course, has been kicked out of the home, especially since the 1960s, especially in the African American, or as Kazol puts it, black community. It was because of the war on poverty started by President Lyndon Baines Johnson and continued under subsequent presidents in which the black family has been dismantled and almost disintegrated. Without the father at home, children suffer as well as the entire community. Just look at the single motherhood rate in the black community. While it was hovering above 20 to 30-ish percent before the introduction of the war on poverty, the non-marital birth rate of black Americans has skyrocketed and, of course, has increased for all races. Now, I'm sure the sexual revolution had a small part to do with this, but the expulsion of the father and families has contributed greatly to the great social decline in our nation without the father at home to raise children and, of course, make a living. No wonder there isn't much money going into the schools for many black students compared to whites or even Asians. Ooh. Now, like I said earlier, Kazol is attempting to make the reader believe that the United States has a system of education devised by white people to keep the black man down despite not acknowledging or exploring the reasons why there are poor white communities and schools as well. For example, regarding race on page 109, I ask him, the principal of course of a school in New York, will white children and black children ever go to school together in New York? 
The principal replied, I don't see it. I just don't think it's going to happen. It's a dream. I simply do not see white folks in Riverdale agreeing to cross bus with kids like these. A few maybe, but very few. I don't think I'll live to see it happen. Now, the author Cazole goes on to ask the principal whether race is the decisive factor. Many experts believe, according to Cazole, that wealth is more important in determining these inequalities. The principal replied with, this would not happen to white children. Now, of course, the principal on this page isn't necessarily wrong, but also not correct. You must ask yourself, why would a large portion, not all, but a large portion of white people make sure that their children attend at least an okay school? Is it because of blatant racism? Or is there more to it? Now, like I mentioned before, the dismantling of the American family has drastically impacted social and economic life in the country. I argue that the reason why white people wouldn't let their children go to mostly subpar schools is because the parents of white children, generally, don't want their kids to receive a bad education. The parents of these white students or children are involved in the education of their children. I'm not saying that all white people are involved in the education of their children, but the majority at least try at least try to be. They want to make sure that their children do at least okay in school. You don't have that in the predominantly black schools because the father ain't home. Sure, you can bring up that the black single mothers want the best for their children, but that's kind of a lie. Black single mothers, and of course, you can have white single mothers, Asian single mothers, even Hispanic single mothers. They choose or chose to bring a child into this world and took on the consequences for the future of that child. You can claim to want the best for your children, but if you do not create at least the best possible environment for the children to succeed or the child, then don't blame anyone else for your own problems. And unfortunately, this problem has swallowed the black community for the most part. I want to bring up, though, that there are poor white communities that Kazol attempts to mention, but fails to address the issues of those schools because Kazol only wants to focus on race. For example, at the end of the book on page 277, the author mentions that he sees the terrible conditions that poor white children face when going to school. In this part of Cincinnati, it's almost exclusively white. There is no racial discrimination here, even though poverty exists. It's almost as if it isn't a race issue regarding education, but Kozol, throughout the entire book, wants to make the inequalities of, of education about race. Regarding the Cincinnati community, Kozol glosses over the issues that plague the education system for the poor whites. He merely presents what he sees and stops before arriving at the logical conclusion that it isn't white people keeping black people down. For if it was, then all white people would be prospering at the expense of minorities, and that doesn't fit the socialist narrative. Now, to further explore the idea that Kozol is pushing an, ideolo an ideological narrative, he conveniently leaves out a minority that has generally been successful in the United States. And of course, I am talking about Asians, but more specifically Koreans, Japanese, and Chinese folks. On page 152, Kozol reports that he visited a suburban high school in New York in which he only saw whites and Asians. Hmm, even though the school had a very small percentage of Hispanics and blacks. Are white people keeping Asians down? Or or as well as the small percentage of Hispanics and Blacks? Obviously not. Some Asians were successful to be a part of this wealthy high school. If Kazol wanted to push his narrative of white people keeping black people down in education, then he would also argue that Asians are keeping black people down, but that doesn't make any sense. It's almost as if this issue or this education issue isn't about race, but someone is pushing for a race issue in education.
just like what I explained. Though socialists and communists always compare themselves to the 1% or the wealthiest of the wealthy, like on page 268. Throughout the entire book, it's almost ridiculously expanded upon or talked about comparing the drastically poor schools to the wealthiest schools, no matter what. There's no comparison, for the most part, to your average school in the nation, in any state. In this case, Cazol attempts to imply that it is the wealthiest people who were white in the Piedmont district of Northern California, refusing to give more money to the poorest people in Oakland, California in 1990. Socialists and communists like Cazol do not care about the average American who doesn't make hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions of dollars. All he cares about is how the super wealthy live. That's all he cares about. In my own specific case of my own life, I never attended the wealthiest schools. If anything, all the schools that I went to received 30% or less than the national average as well as the state average. Yet, the people I went to school with, you know, my entire student body, turned out generally fine. And we found opportunities after our public education. It's almost as if there's more to education than just throwing money at a problem. And finally, I want to address the issue of funding education. It is unfair that public education is currently largely funded by property taxes. Why should the wealthier individuals pay for a system that everyone is supposed to use? That is unfair. And by, of course, by what I mean by wealthier, I'm not just saying the extremely rich. I'm also including the common American and the rest of middle America. If Kazol actually wanted the education system to be funded for everyone, then everyone should contribute to the system, not just the wealthier. After all, isn't it more fair if everyone contributes? If Kazol wants to push for equality, then wouldn't he want everyone to equally contribute their fair share? But, you know, again, of course. A fair share, according to socialists and communists, always involves stealing much more money away from those who earned it for no other reason than socialist and communist greed. Regardless though, I'm sure I've missed a few points here and there that I would like to further discuss, but oh well, that's all the time for that we have. But I wanted to make this video to give you an example of how academia is pushing for the acceptance of socialism and equality into teachers who would then push socialism and equality into their own students. This is a top-down approach to install or instill socialism into the future generations. And as a person who is in the classroom, I want to make sure that you are aware of what is going on, especially in public education, but also in higher education as well. But anyways... Thank you very much for watching. I'm Brazen Eagle, and I hope you do have a great, great day.